Tourism is not Limassol's strong point. The island's second largest city is a busy port and manufacturing area. It is busy, crowded with vehicles, and offers all the amenities and disadvantages of modern urban living. It does this in the confines of streets and buildings built for a different age. With their acceptance into the EU and the money that has brought, Limassol is bent on making the oceanfront pleasurable for residents and visitors alike. Parking on the front is easy and the visitor is immediately drawn to the long promenade. He is greeted with fountains, and sculpted artwork, set into small independent squares. These are interspersed with green areas, which invite you to rest a while. We are informed that the park was inaugurated by Mr. Tassos Papadopoulos in 2003. It provides a very enjoyable hour or so. And of course, we have to stop somewhere for a comforting drink. Unlike Limassol, Larnaca has its eye well and truly on the tourist. Its beach and promenade are very reminiscent of seaside places in Britain. How about a bandstand of Greek columns, a seat in the Cypriot sun, and traditional music to the background of the blue Mediterranean. The Larnaca Express did not tempt us. We preferred instead to walk the interesting streets and find our own nooks and crannies.
The yacht marina, situated at the north end of the centre, has attractions for the sightseer. We had a fun time watching a group of students learning to be galley slaves. Ignoring the other attractions available to us, we took once more to exploring the city. According to tradition, Lazarus, the man resurrected by Christ, arrived here after the Pharisees had set him adrift in a leaky boat. He is said to have been buried here in Ios Lazarus Church. Paphos is at the far western end of the island, necessitating an hour or so's car ride. The true town centre is three kilometres up the hill, but we headed straight for the harbour. So, it would seem, did everybody else. We strolled among a rather undistinguished stretch of restaurants and tavernas and looked out at the goings-on in the harbour. In the same area, though, are the famous Paphos mosaics. And an incredible treasure trove of ancient buildings. Not nearly so old is the reworked western tower of a much larger castle dating from 1391. It's now an occasional venue for events like the opera evenings during the Aphrodite festival in September. We learnt that this day was Cyprus Day and some of their navy was on display. The town authorities have found their own methods for keeping the crowds in order.
Back in Limassol, which incidentally is now officially called Lemosos, some more exploring was called for. The area known as Old Town was once the Turkish commercial district. The Jami Kabir Minaret is still used by the remaining Arab and Turkish residents. The back streets and bazaars, while absolutely fascinating, are rather limited and pokey. But this is where to find lovely Cypriot lace at very reasonable prices. One very pleasant arcade is full of touristy things to encourage browsing. In the same area sits Limassol Castle, which is a careful restoration. Tradition has it that Richard the Lionheart married Berengaria here in 1191 and had himself crowned King of Cyprus. Inside is housed the Cyprus Medieval Museum, where cameras were not allowed. The pleasant little garden surrounding the castle holds ancient monuments, mosaics, and a very interesting olive oil press. This is a reconstruction of one found north of the town and dates from the 7th to the 9th centuries. The weight stone is combined with a screw which makes it easier to lift the stone. Oil is separated from the water as, being lighter, it remains in the first pit. Before leaving, we couldn't resist joining the locals in strolling along the prom, prom, prom. The Cypriot world is buzzing with activity and growth, but it remains to be seen whether good taste can compete with the desire to cash in. Either way, it will be fascinating to watch the progress over the next few years.